Okay, so I think we're gonna, the first image you're gonna see is a picture of me as a kid. Um, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born in 1981, I'm 34 if you're gonna do the math. So I'm on the bottom right here with the red hat and this was a snow day so school was canceled. And these are all our friends, you know, from the street. We had kind of what you would describe now as a free range childhood. A street with a bunch of kids on it and we went out and did our own thing, came home when the street lights came on. Um, uh, yeah kind of old school you would describe it. Nowadays, um, if you pay attention to the media, uh, childhood is described as this time where kids are you know, addicted to video games, they're overweight, they're undereducated, and if they're not, then they're overprotected by their uptight helicopter parents. Um, that's sort of how things are presented. But of course, I know that doesn't have to be the case, and probably you know as well, that kids are as smart and funny and weird and crazy and fun and creative as, a, as they've ever been. So how can we kind of like nurture this reality um, as opposed to the previous reality that we see perpetuated in, in the media a lot? Um, I started thinking about this when I heard about something called the Imagination Playground back in 2010. Um, the Imagination Playground opened in New York City and it had two sort of essential qualities. And one of them was um, it featured loose parts. So instead of apparatus that are bolted to the ground, um, they had these big beautiful foam blocks that kids could move around and play with, build with. And a loose part is essentially a thing that can be anything. Um, and it really expanded the play opportunities for the children who were playing there. Um, and loose parts are, um, they don't have to be beautiful design objects though, of course, right? So the loose parts that we played with as kids were sticks, rope, crap from the garage, um, basically anything you can kind of get your hands on and, and turn and incorporate into the game that you create in your imagination. So I learned that this idea was actually, um, I'm sorry, of, of uh, the Imagination Playground was inspired by something called an Adventure Playground, which has a long history in the UK. Um, and an Adventure Playground is basically a preserved habitat for children, like a place where they can do whatever they want. Um, and it's, these places, there's hundreds of them throughout the UK and other places, have been around since the Second World War when um, children were observed flocking to bombed out rubble um, and, you know, sort of occupying those spaces and making them their own. So some clever adults were like, well, look, if this is what you want to play with and where you want to play, then we'll give you your own junk site while we rebuild the building that used to be here. Um, and in these play sites that were developed um, were, a, were staff of adults called play workers who essentially um, maintain the space and support the kids in what they're doing, whether that means testing out the weird apparatus that they built or sort of standing by um, while kids do their thing. So I got to visit the Land Adventure Playground, which is affectionately considered a junk playground. Um, and you can see there's lots of loose parts here, so tires, bikes, sometimes you see things that are familiar. Um, there's water, there's rocks, there's fallen leaves and sticks. Some, um, and the land provides all kinds of materials, um, including hammers, nails, and other things, and, um, and they also employ a staff of play workers. So the play workers are there not to come up with games for the kids to play, but basically to lock up at night and provide the materials that the kids want. So if they're like, we want to build a fort, it's like, okay, well then I'll go dumpster diving and find you some pallets, and then you can. Um, so here is Luke in the blue shirt. He's not needed by the kids. They haven't asked for his help or anything of him, so he's just kind of chilling, making himself available, keeping a passive eye while the kids hang out at the fire pit and sit on a decrepit old mattress. Um, but there are other times when he is more incorporated in the play. For example, here, um, he, said when he said about this incident, he said, I don't know where she got that, but as soon as I saw it, I knew exactly where I was going. <laughs> So he's very um, patient, well-trained, um, effective play worker. So I would venture to guess, you know, if you give children permission to do whatever they want, they're gonna do something that's gonna freak you out, basically, and you have to kind of be prepared for that. And I would venture to guess that of the people in this room, at, at least a majority, if not everyone, had an experience playing with fire as a child, whether it was blowing out birthday candles, or melting your shoes at a campfire, or um, blowing stuff up, 
outside of the watchful eye of your parents um, or knew someone who did that. And so fire is an element that kids have access to. And here um, is Dave, an older play worker, who's very familiar with these kids who are having this fire. And he's able to be present and monitor the fire without um, intervening and um, imposing himself on the play, which is a very specific talent. So I spent a lot of time there, and I did a lot of reflecting afterwards about when do I intervene on children's play? Why? What is motivating my intervention? And I realized that a lot of it is like me being uncomfortable and not because the kids are doing anything bad necessarily. So my time with play workers came back to haunt me when these two kids were, I was driving with them, friends of ours, and they popped up from the back seat and with these two boxes of matches and just like Luke, I don't know where the matches came from, but I knew exactly what was about to happen. Um, and we spent the next 45 minutes striking every single match in the box, burning every matchstick, fighting over the remaining matches and burning the boxes. And I really used it as an opportunity to channel my inner play worker and I kept my hands in my pockets and I bit my tongue unless I was specifically engaged by the kids. And it was a really interesting um, experience for me. And then we went on, to, you know, once the matches were gone, went on to something that actually does freak me out and that's playing on a frozen pond. I'm not from around here and it totally is terrifying. Um, but they had a very playful afternoon and I had a very reflective afternoon sort of considering what was motivating my interventions. Um, and in doing so, I hope that I was able to sort of narrow the gap between um, the childhood experiences that I remember so fondly and, um, and the ones that, I, that kids today sort of are, are experiencing. So, um, you know, childhood is a universal experience, and I've noticed that the more I keep my hands in my pockets, um, the more enriching things become for everyone. So, thank you.